We are standing in the courtyard of the Florida's Capitol Complex. Behind you is the new Capitol, and behind me is the historic Capitol. And this has been the site of Florida's Capitol building since Florida became a state in 1845, and this structure behind me was completed. If you look at the current structure, the two end wings, um, which are the wings for the House and Senate chamber where there's a slight bump out, um, those were added in 1902. So it was um, just the middle portion. And the core of this structure still is that 1845 structure. So even though the, uh, the capital has been changed many times, the heart of it has been here since Florida became a state. Between 1902, when this version of the building was constructed, and um, the late 1970s, popula Florida's population just grew tremendously. It's now 19 million people compared to 500,000. So um, they needed more room for their representatives. And the, there was a call to expand the building. In 1922, the building was expanded. In 1936, it was expanded. It was expanded many times until it was more than three times the size that it is right now, the historic capital. So when the new capital was constructed, this 22-story modern tower, the historic capital was going to be demolished, but the citizen campaign to save the old capital um, had, had prevailed, and the two buildings were going to coexist in one capital complex. But how exactly the, the historic capital would, re, would be restored to was then the debate. It wasn't whether we save it or not, it was what time period should we restore it to. And the 1902 version offered great benefits because all three branches of government were in this one building. And the goal of the Department of State was to turn it into a museum and use it as a teaching tool for Florida school children. So being able to come to this one site and see the Supreme Court, the governor's office, and the House and Senate chambers and understand the three branches of government and how they work together really was a benefit. Another benefit was, of course, they wouldn't have to remove the iconic dome that had become a symbol of Florida's government. So the decision was made to save it, and they started working towards this meticulous restoration to preserve this building and identify what did it look like in 1902 so that um, an accurate restoration could take place. The red and white awnings on the historic capital are one of the most striking and significant features of Florida's capital. They were present on the building in the late 19th century, in fact, and when the additions were made in 1902, they retained them, and really they were very functional. They were here to, before air conditioning, to shade the windows, and it really does provide a significant amount of shade. Recently they had to be replaced, and it felt quite a bit warmer in the building when they were off. but. During the restoration, the awnings were put back on. They hadn't been on the building since the 1920s, and when they first were put back on, they were very controversial. People thought, it's making our capital look like an ice cream parlor, a barber shop, and now, though, I think that it's been uh, over 30 years since the restoration was complete, and people have come to love them and see them as a representative feature of their capital. Right now, we're in the house chamber. Uh, as it was added by Frank Milburn in 1902. And it, at that point, it was added to the existing core of the structure, which had been finished in 1845. So we are actually in the newer part of it. The two additions in 1902 were the house chamber uh, on all three floors, by the way, all the way down. And then uh, at the other end of the building, the Senate wing, which was the same size and also extended through three floors. Essentially, it doubled the original size of the old Capitol building. And for the time, for 1902, it meant that it was, uh, they had caught up now. And they were, as you can see the chamber here, uh, with its 68 members and all, they were, they were right at where modernity was. They had brought in steam, heat, uh, electrical lighting that you see here, the Cassidy combination fixtures with gas lighting and so on. These obviously are replicated light fixtures. And the muted versions, if you look into the top there and you can see it, of, of rose, white, and blue. 
muted versions of red, white, and blue. This was right on the heels of the war with Spain, the uh, Spanish-American War, and patriotism in the country was very high, no less so in Florida because it had had such a pivotal role to play in that conflict. And under our feet also, another thing that Milburn did, again, going back to the, to the, uh, to the role of the, uh, of, 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 the, of the military in the late 90s, uh, 1890s, and so on, the United States Navy had pioneered the use of linoleum on its vessels. The, uh, the explanation was it was supposed to reduce the, uh, the splintering from incoming shells, from enemy shells, as they exploded on decks and so on. But it served another purpose because it, it's easy to clean, it's very shiny, it, it serves those, those military specifications of spit shine look, and so everybody liked the looks of it. The very big problem was, though, that it had a very bad smell. Uh, it was a, a uh, it, one, of the, one, of the, one of the products that goes into it is petroleum. And while it looked really good, a lot of people, especially the women in Tallahassee, were very bothered by that. And it was like, what do we do about it? They agonized over this because the session was going to start in 1903, and here it was 1902, and it smelled pretty bad. And so the Tallahassee Garden Club and the women associated with that hit upon a great idea. Before the opening of the session in spring, Tallahassee is known for its flowers, known for its bouquets, known for all the things that are in bloom then. And they wisely and carefully picked all of the blooming, most fragrant flowers they could find and loaded them onto the legislative desks in the House and the Senate. Uh, one of the reporters for the Florida Times Union noticed that and wrote about it and, uh, and, and commented uh, by way of compliment that uh, even though he knew why it had happened, he was much impressed. And uh, it completely did kill the smell of the old linoleum. An interesting sideline to all this is that in future years, on those biennial years when the legislature met, they continued to follow that pattern. People got used to having those bouquets on the desks, and it was done year after year after year. Then in 1968, the legislature went to an annual opening, an annual uh, uh, event, and those bouquets continued, and they continue still. Now it's in the new capital rather than the, the, the Florida historic capital, but it's one of those things, one of those many things, that started here and was taken there, just across the courtyard where it continues still. The restoration that was done in the late 1970s was extremely problematic um, for a number of reasons. Principally, they could not find the plans that Milburn had used once they elected to go to the 1902 structure. They couldn't find the plans that they used to bring that about. And so they had to rely on historic photographs, archeological evidence that were built into the walls, and a number of, uh, of, of very fortuitous finds in the walls themselves. This is the rotunda, the second floor rotunda. You're on the eastern side of the grand staircase, looking uh, e directly east uh, over in my direction. And what's interesting about where we are standing is, somebody remembered that there was a practice that some architects did when they were finished with the building to roll up the plans that they really no longer needed and drop them down the wall, seal it up. With that idea, they decided, well, they haven't turned up anywhere else. Let's look in the walls, which is what they did. They opened up the walls from the attic, which is the only place you really have access to them, in beside the old chimneys and all the rest of that, wall by wall. And when they got right to the arch over my left shoulder here, just in the back there. When they got right there, the, the historical architects and the investigators, shining lights down there, could not find the plans, but what they did get was a reflected light of something that was sending that light back. Looked like glass. And then the question was, how and the what is it and where did it come from? So let's look, everybody said. Now the thing about an art glass subdome, once they realized that some of those pieces of glass had beveled edges, it, it dawned on them, after some interviews with people to whom they could, they could ask, that the glass was unlikely a, a flat window and more like a raised parabola, probably, shape. What they did discover was, in the course of time, the art glass subdome, which is over our heads and that is one of the principal features that draw people into the building, something that was missing either in about 10 years after Milburn uh, added this, this, this on, or at the time that Clutho added his uh, wings on in the 1920s. 
that original art glass had been removed and probably workmen had been told to discard it and being good resourceful workmen figured why not throw it into an empty wall, which everybody ever since has been very glad that that is what they did. Because original glass could not be used, that original glass could not be used, but it could be copied. And once the copies were made and the pattern was discovered, and after endless experimentation, the jigsaw methods of putting it all together, the window could be recreated as indeed it was. And the panels that you see there rest on those coffers that are underneath them as the best educated guess for what was there in 1902. In 1902, people could come and visit their governor very easily. It was a small state and small staff, and there was a lot of access to elected officials. We are in the restored governor's suite. There were just three offices and a waiting gallery. But one thing that's really noticeable in this room is you look around the walls, you see portraits of all the former governors who've served in our state. And something that stands out to many people is that they all look very similar to one another. They um, are men, there, ha there has not been a woman uh, governor, and they are all of Caucasian descent. This whole building is a place where we want people to come and know that no matter what you look like, you can still play a role in the political process. And a story that helps to demonstrate that point is of May Man Jennings. She was the wife of Governor William Sherman Jennings. He was governor in 1902 and oversaw the expansion and um, additions to the building in 1902. And this was his office, this was his desk, this is his original desk behind us. And May Mann grew up coming to Tallahassee with her father, Austin Mann, who served in the legislature. She really got interested in the political process. She participated in campaigns and fundraisers. She rallied garden clubs to vote for her father. and then. She was able to meet her husband and then became the wife of a politician. He was a judge when they met and he ran for office, became governor. And while he was governor, he called her his right-hand man. She kept uh, index cards of all the bills and legislation that he was interested in following and getting passed. And she sat in the chambers and people knew that she meant business when she would, have, she would basically lobby for the issues that he was trying to get through. And together they were able to pass environmental reform and um, protections for very progressive children and family protections in the early 20th century. And she, after he died, this was, this was in 1901 to 1905, so long before women had the right to vote yet. And she went on to be one of the co-founders of the Florida chapter of the League of Women Voters and continued to be active in politics after he had passed. When this building was being threatened with demolition, the idea was to look forward and to um, try to promote progress. But the people of the state that called for the preservation of this building or restoration, they recognized that in order to move forward, you have to understand where you've been. And having the historic capital right here next to the new capital gives that perspective and lets people know that it's not just about the here and now. There's a, a past that has led us to this point and we've made mistakes, but we've also made a lot of progress and this just gives it a lot more context. And I feel very fortunate that we in Florida have the historic capital to balance out the goals that are taking place in the um, building across the courtyard.